Now, Father God, we thank you for this beautiful and wonderful day that you've given us. We thank you for your many blessings that are uncountable, immeasurable. Father, I pray this morning that as we seek in this moment some sort of effort, some sort of experience that honors you and glorifies you, that we would find a way to humble ourselves to do that. That we would find a way to find joy in the celebration of your promises and what you've done for us. That we would find hope in Christ and what he did for us. So that our worship would be genuine, that it would be true, that it wouldn't be dependent on our own feelings, our own desires, our own likes, that it would be dependent solely on the moving of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Father, I pray that you would free us from all of the things outside of this place that are a distraction from you, that have become an idol that we've worshipped or that we've clung on to, that we would come in this moment and cling solely to the cross, to the cross of Christ our Savior, that we might stand firm in your promises and that hope that he offers. Father, move us in powerful ways this morning, that we might experience you in a different way, in a powerful way than we have in quite some time. Father, we pray these things, ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. This morning, for our scripture reading, I'd love to spend some time in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 52. This is one of the great prophetic passages regarding Christ, regarding other things as well, but especially his importance to Israel and through extension, the world, the nations as well. Isaiah chapter 52. I'd like to start in verse 1 this morning. Awake. Awake. Put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For there shall no more come into you the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake yourselves from the dust and arise. Be seated, O Jerusalem. Loose the bonds from your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus says the Lord, You were sold for nothing, and you shall be redeemed without money. For thus says the Lord God, my people went down at the first into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them for nothing. Now therefore, what have I here, declares the Lord, seeing that my people are taken away for nothing. The rulers wail, declares the Lord, and continually all the day my name is despised. Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore in that day they shall know that it is I who speak, here I am. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news and publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Verse 8, the voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy, for eye to eye they see and return to the Lord to Zion. Break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Depart. Depart. Go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her. Purify yourselves, you who bear the vessels of the Lord, for you shall not go out in haste, and you shall not go out in flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you for this text, this passage, this portion of Isaiah, in which we see this beautiful contrast. We see your people and their city, Jerusalem, or Zion, near destruction. We see that 
Your enemies, Lord, have laid waste to your people and their land. And yet out of that waste, out of that torment, out of that pain and that suffering comes singing. It comes rejoicing over the salvation that you bring, the strength that you bring. Father, we see here the, the prophecy that at the time for Israel seemed negative, but, but now is so positive that a time when unclean things will come into your place, but not be unclean, that they would be clean, that they would be pure, that they would be acceptable to you. And Lord, we today as as people who are not part of Israel, not part of your chosen people, no connection to Jerusalem, enjoy that benefit. Because we were once thought of as unclean, but you, Lord, make us clean. We, as your created beings, as your image bearers, are good. Yes, we're sinful. Yes, we need salvation. But when you look at us, you see us as those whom you desire to be saved. And Father, I thank you for that. Father, we lift up at this time those who need you most, those whom we know and love who need you and, and need uh, your guiding hand and need you to be their rear guard. Father, I think of Larry Ambrose, who's uh, gone this morning because he's having a test coming up and he's preparing for that. Uh, some minor things, but Lord, we pray that you would be his rear guard, that you would come alongside him and give him strength, that you would fortify him, that you would give wisdom to the medical staff involved and give some answers to Larry and to Judy. Father, we also pray for Don and Sally, with their trip to Texas, that all would be well there. I've heard there's some bad weather there, so Father, we pray that you would be merciful and gracious to them and those whom they love we're spending time with. And Father, we pray for the men tomorrow morning connected with the Grace Gospel Fellowship who will be testing for licensing or ordination tomorrow. Father, we pray that you would be their rear guard. That you would give them wisdom, that you would give them insight, that you would comfort them and give them a sense of peace in a stressful time. Father, we pray these things, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. But just in way of announcements, the only thing I really uh, think should be mentioned is the last thing I prayed for. Uh, tomorrow morning, uh, I have the privilege, the honor of uh, being a tester for the exams for those men who are going up for licensing or ordination tomorrow for the Grace Gospel Fellowship. I'll be on a team with two other ordained men, and there's a few teams testing these, uh, mostly young guys. And uh, just uh, want you to be praying for them, especially tomorrow morning. I think we get there for coffee and donuts at 8.30, and we finish eating lunch at 1. And between those meal periods is just three or four hours there of testing. Uh, so it's a pretty rigorous time, pretty stressful time, though it's not really as bad as uh, people usually think going into it. Uh, do pray for them to have wisdom and be able to recall all the things they, they've studied and especially give them a sense of peace. Uh, I know most of the guys doing this, and I'm sure they're going to do uh, just fine with that, move on to the next level, or uh, be ordained tomorrow. So uh, that's really all I have for announcements. Uh, at this point, we'll have a moment of instrumental music, and then we'll continue singing hymns together. Well, that is a song that I uh, have not sung in quite a while, and that I thoroughly enjoy. I appreciate the music team for bringing us uh, the ability to worship with some live and beautiful music. So thank you for that. Now this morning, we are continuing in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 10. And last week, we started chapter 10. We started this really long, difficult text of Acts 10 and 11, where we've seen the apostle Peter and the God-fearer Cornelius interacting with each other. We met Cornelius saw that he was in Caesarea, a beautiful, extravagant Roman city built to glorify Augustus Caesar, saw that he was a Roman centurion in charge of a hundred uh, men, saw that he was a Gentile god fearer or a near convert to Judaism, comparing that with a proselyte who would be a Gentile who fully converted to Judaism. 
we saw that he was a man who was pious in the sense that he gave alms and he prayed, that he was well respected. And then we saw his vision, his vision of an angel coming, and we'll describe that and see that described again in later detail. But this vision of the angel that comes, it tells him to go and to send for Peter, who is in Joppa, who would come and who would share a message with him for his salvation. We discovered that Cornelius was not saved. Despite being a devout man, despite giving charitably, despite praying uh, without ceasing, he was not saved. There was something about his life where his works were good. We saw that God was pleased as if his works were a pleasing sacrifice to God. But even when our works are a pleasing sacrifice to God, even when our life is full of good things, if our faith isn't properly aligned, if our trust isn't fully put in God, then there's no salvation there. Those works are relatively fruitless. We see that God sets in motion this meeting between Cornelius and Peter so that Cornelius could be saved. And much of what God is doing in Acts chapter 10 is preparing Peter for something that would happen about 12 years later in Acts chapter 15. We get to Acts chapter 15 later, and it's about 12 years that have gone by. And what's happening here in Acts 10 is preparing Peter for that moment. Uh, those of you familiar with it will say, well, Acts 15 is the Jerusalem Council when uh, the believers gather in Jerusalem to discuss how the Jews and Gentile believers in Christ are going to get along and, and live together peacefully. And this is preparing Peter for that moment. God is breaking down some of Peter's cultural and religious prejudices. And I want to be clear that the prejudices that are being broken down here are cultural and religious. They're not biblical prejudices. They're cultural. They're religious. They're based on tradition or years of a certain understanding of the Jewish people that is misinformed. I want to pick up in Acts chapter 10 with verse 9. <clears throat> and here in verse 9, we find ourselves in Joppa with the Apostle Peter. Remember, Cornelius has already had his vision. He's already sent some men to go and get Peter. And this is where we pick up the story in Acts 10, verse 9. The next day, as they were on their journey, that is those sent by Cornelius, and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour, that's noon, to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all the kinds of animals, reptiles, and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for... I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. The voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. This is happening about a day after Cornelius has his vision. And Peter is on the rooftop and he's praying. It's noon. It's the middle of the afternoon. And Peter likely prayed in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. That was something that wasn't commanded in Scripture, but it is the example that's set forth in multiple places in Scripture. Now, certainly Jesus uh, had probably similar uh, behaviors, habits. We see him going off alone to pray quite often, and that's what Peter does. He's alone on the roof, and he's praying. In Psalm 55, which is a psalm written by David, it says this, Evening and morning and at noon I utter my complaint and moan, and he hears my voice. Uh, it's a song here where David's writing about his experiences, sort of complaining and grieving and doing that to God, morning and afternoon and evening. In Daniel 6.10, it says, When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. 
He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. And so Daniel's praying morning, afternoon, and evening. And so that's what Peter's probably doing. At the very least, he's praying in the afternoon here. And most of the roofs in this place would be flat roofs, uh, which would be great spots for privacy and prayer. Oftentimes, they'd even have these canopies built there so that you go on the roof and still have shade. So you put up these posts and you put a sheet or a blanket or whatever, a canopy specifically designed for that purpose, so you could have shade. So it'd be a bit cooler if you're on the roof having some private time. And Peter's hungry. He's waiting for food that's being prepared inside the house below him. And God uses that hunger to teach Peter an important truth through a vision, a vision regarding food, regarding animals. It's possible even that as Peter's sort of almost falling asleep into this vision, that's the language used, this kind of vision is one that happens when you're asleep, same kind of word that's used to describe Adam when he falls asleep, uh, that God then takes Eve out of his rib. Uh, that's what's happening here. It's likely that God's using this hunger he's experiencing, and he's using this canopy, which is like this four-cornered sheet above him, incorporating those elements into this vision here. God's using his experiences to bless him with this vision, where he sees the food, he sees the animals, clean animals and unclean animals. Now, Acts 10, verse 11 and 12 again. Uh, and he saw the heavens open and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all the kinds of animals, reptiles, and birds of the air. Uh, this list of animals matches very closely the list of animals uh, given to Noah, that Noah was to bring into the ark to save the animals, but also those animals he was meant to bring into the ark to use for food. Remember, Noah is before all of the laws against clean and unclean animals are given, and so he's given some of these animals for food. In Genesis 6, it describes that. God says to Noah, But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to their kinds, of the animals according to their kinds, and of creeping, every creeping thing on the ground according to its kind. Two of every sort shall come into you to keep them alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Uh, no one was, no one was given these animals to save them. He's given animals for food. And just as Peter is being given these animals to kill and to eat, to every kind of animal, every kind of food is being offered to Peter here. Uh, particularly, even more so than animals could be offered here, there were certain grains, certain plants that weren't allowed to be eaten. They'd be unclean. <coughs> Peter's getting the whole gamut, the whole menu is being presented to him in this white sheet vision. Now, verse 13. And there came a voice to him. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. You know, Peter says no to the Lord. And when he says no, he's using this word here, metamos. Uh, don't remember that, but the word there is metamos, and metamos is a word that implies a polite refusal. And so it's easy to read this and say, Peter's having this outbursts, or maybe he's upset, but he's not. He's, he's very politely responding to God here, saying, no, no, I, I can't do that. I, I've never eaten anything unclean. I, I wouldn't do that, Lord. Uh, perhaps he thinks it's a test. Perhaps not, but the reply that he has to God is one that is polite. It's very different than what you usually see from Peter, at least before this in the Gospels, where he would reply quite boldly to God uh, with brashness and sometimes with frustrating emotion and anger behind it. It's not one of defiance, his response. His response is one of polite desire to fulfill God's law and to honor that. A complete list of the unclean foods can be found in Leviticus 11. Leviticus 11 has a huge list. The whole chapter is long, has it. But I want to read some of it, the first portion of it, 
just so you get a, a glimpse for some of this and you'll see some animals you recognize are meant to be unclean here. Leviticus 11, verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, These are the living things that you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth. Whatever parts the hoof and is cloven-footed and chews the cud among the animals, you may eat. Nevertheless, among those that chew the cud or part of the hoof, you shall not eat these. The camel because it chews the cud, but does not part the hoof, is unclean to you. And the rock badger, because it chews the cud, but does not part the hoof, is unclean to you. And the hare, because it chews the cud, but does not part the hoof, is unclean to you. And the pig, that's the one we usually recognize, the pig, because it parts the hoof, and is cloven-footed, but does not chew the cud, is unclean to you. You shall not eat any of their flesh. You shall not touch their carcasses. They are unclean to you. Now here we see just this list of uh, mammals here that they're not allowed to eat in a description, an example of each kind of this rule. And we're not going to get into all the details of that, but there's these clear rules. You go on to read the text and it describes the birds you can't eat, the fish you can't eat, the plants you can't eat, all there in Leviticus 11. Very strict rules. And not only are they not to eat them, they're not even to touch the carcass of these things. If they were to find a camel, or if they were to be riding a camel, and it were to die in the desert, bringing them stuff, they would have to very carefully, and they would do this, they would very carefully remove things that the camel was carrying. Or better yet, they would hire somebody else, a non-Jewish person, to do that for them. Because they weren't even to touch the carcasses of these animals. These food laws were a central and integral part of the Jewish faith and people, and still are today. Yet Peter has this vision on the rooftop in which God orders him to kill, which would require touching the carcass of it, to kill and to eat these unclean foods. This is happening at a time when the Apostle Paul elsewhere in the world is receiving the teachings of Christ about the mystery about the message of God's grace for believers, that they would not be bound by the yoke of the law, especially these laws pertaining to food or these other things that made Israel unique, these things that were meant to uh, take Israel and make them look and seem and feel and be different than all other nations. Not only that, God puts in a lot of rules that seem weird to us today, but in the ancient world helped to keep them safe often. But these rules that made Israel distinct, or these rituals that they had for cleansing, were not rules that we today are meant to follow or be in bondage to. And the Apostle Paul is learning that from Jesus Christ at the very moments that Peter is having this vision and this experience. And so Peter hasn't heard that from the Apostle Paul yet. He's getting this straight from God. Peter has no idea that God is giving grace to those who practice these things. And this vision serves to show him that before he visits Cornelius, who is still considered a Gentile despite his faith, uh, the God of the Jews. And then we see God's response to Peter's polite and law-abiding refusal here. He politely says, no, God, I've never eaten an unclean animal. I would never eat any of those things. You can trust me. And this is what God says. Verse 14 uh, but Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Verse 15 is what God says. And the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common or do not call unclean. The central point of this vision is there in verse 15. What God has made clean, do not call common. It's a very strange thing for God to basically put a image, a vision of every unclean thing you could possibly imagine up on a sheet and to say, don't, don't call that unclean, which is really strange considering God calls it unclean a lot in Scripture. But he tells Peter not to call that unclean. Now, later in the text, Peter identifies the application of this lesson that God has given. So we'll skip there just for a moment. Verse 28. Verse 28. This is what this vision means. Peter sums it up here. Verse 28. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. 
But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. He says, I shall not call any person common or unclean. The visions of animals. I don't think that the vision includes people up there. I think it's animals that God is showing Peter here. But now he's applying it to people. And that's the point. That's the lesson that God has here. It's not just about animals or food. It's about people. Though he reveals the application in this verse, verse 28, at this point when God is giving the vision, Peter doesn't understand it yet. He doesn't get it. And so he continues to refuse God, and God continues to explain to him that he should not call unclean what he has called clean. And this back and forth happens three times. And this is pretty interesting because Peter is no stranger to triple repetition. In John 13, 38, Jesus says to him, he asks him, will you lay down your life for me? And he says to Peter, truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. He's saying that to Peter. Jesus is about to be uh, put on trial, he's about to be beat, he's about to be tortured, he's about to be put on the cross to do that willingly for us. And he's doing that, and he's telling Peter, who's just made this expression, Peter says, I would die for you, I would go to the cross for you, I would do anything for you. And Jesus says, no, you won't. Before the rooster cries, before the morning comes, this next morning, you will deny me three times. And if you keep reading the Gospels, you see that Peter does that exact thing. He denies Jesus three times. And that's my one of my favorite stories in Scripture, if not my favorite story in Scripture, because of how it's followed up in John 21. In John 21, this is happening after the resurrection. And so Peter denies him. The rooster crows. Jesus is crucified. He's buried for three days. He's risen again to life. And they're just now seeing him again in this beautiful moment. They're having breakfast. And it says this in John 21. Jesus said to Simon, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? It says Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Triple repetition again. Peter denies him, denies him, denies him, and then Jesus restores him, restores him, restores him. He asks him, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And every time Jesus replies, feed my sheep, he basically says, I'm about to leave. You're in charge now. After just denying him three, four days earlier. Love that story. It's absolutely beautiful. And so Peter is no stranger to this triple repetition. And now God in this moment Peter is sort of in charge of this ministry. He's been given the keys to the kingdom. And God explains to him three times what the point of this vision is. And of course, Peter still does not understand. Even after that, he's still perplexed. God explains it, explains it, explains it, and he doesn't get it. And that kind of sounds like typical Peter. He just seems a little bit dense at times. And we know he's still confused because of verse 17. Acts chapter 10, verse 17 now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed, confused as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation. For I have sent them. He was perplexed, confused. He didn't understand. But the keys to understanding this vision were standing at the gate. And they're calling for him. They're looking for him. 
And here we see God's perfect timing. Another example, a small version of God's perfect timing is if you look in your bulletin, the little uh, power papers or whatever those are called, it says God's perfect timing on it. And here we see God's perfect timing. Cornelius has a vision early enough to send men to Joppa to get to the gate of the house that Peter is staying exactly when he's finished this vision. And he's looking for answers. Verse 21. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? They said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who was well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he, that is Peter, invited them in to be his guests. After hearing why they were there at the house to see him, Peter invites them in. Remember, this is a party sent by Cornelius that consists of two of his house members, two people who live with Cornelius, and a Roman soldier. So these are most likely three Gentiles, one of them specifically a Roman soldier who don't exactly treat the Jewish people well normally, but we see he's devout. Peter might not necessarily know that as he sees the soldier standing at the gate. But Peter's willingness to invite them in as guests is a sign, I think, of his heart beginning to soften, beginning to be open to what God is trying to teach him. Remember, the Jews were not fans of the Romans. The Romans were not fans of the Jews. And yet, this fellowship happens where Peter is staying. And verse 22 is a summary of what we as readers of Luke's history here in the book of Acts already know. We've already read it. And yet, Luke includes it here, and he includes it again in the future. So three times the story is repeated of Cornelius' vision. And I think uh, Luke adds that in for us to read again because he wants us to emphasize that Cornelius is a devout man and he wants to emphasize that God's timing is perfect. We see that Peter must have trusted the word of his guests and he must have believed that God was leading in that situation because Peter, despite seeing the Gentile, uh, uh, seeing the gospel going to the Samaritans, was still focused on the main audience that he was meant to bring the good news of the Messiah's coming to. Jesus gives the apostles these instructions in Matthew 10. He says, Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus gives them that mission. Don't worry about the Gentiles. Don't worry about the Samaritans. Go just to the lost sheep of Israel. Later in Acts 1.8, we see that Jesus does intend for that message to spread beyond Israel, into Judea, into Samaria, and it has at this point. But I think Peter still has to have that focus of going to the Jewish people. In fact, after this, maybe except for a, another occasion I might be forgetting about, but uh, Peter has this interaction with these Gentiles who become believers, but after that, the 12 apostles don't really have much dealings with Gentiles after this. They go back to focusing on Israel, and that becomes their mission, their mission field, as God intended it. And so Peter must have believed them, one, because the Spirit told him that he's supposed to go with them, but he must have believed them and been open to them and sees that God is leading. And so he goes with them, verse 24. The next day he rose and went away with them. And some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. I will find out later that's six fellow Christians, Jewish Christians. And on the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked them why you sent for me. Verse 28 there is the sort of is the pivotal verse, and we read this earlier, it's the pivotal verse in this text, I think, where it says, And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit 
anyone of another nation, so a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. And here it almost sounds like a contradiction. You know it's unlawful, but God says, because God does not contradict or change his law. It's not a contradiction here. But Peter is speaking here in a very similar style to that which Jesus would use. When Jesus would often say, you heard it said this, but I tell you this. We see that, especially in, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, we see that quite often. When Jesus did that, he wasn't changing God's law. He wasn't saying God was wrong. He was clarifying the law. And he was emphasizing the law's ability to reveal our sin as broken and hurting people. And when Peter does it, he's pointing to a law that is not given by God. And so when he says, you've heard that it's unlawful, he's not saying the Bible says it's unlawful. He's just saying, you've heard that it's unlawful. He's talking about a law that has become the common accepted view of Jews in the first century. Last week we met Cornelius, the God-fearing Gentile who was known by the Jews in that community, likely through his relationship in the synagogues, to be a righteous man. But there's nothing really new about an uncircumcised Gentile attending a synagogue service. What is new is that a Jewish believer is sent into the home of an uncircumcised Gentile to have fellowship and to eat Gentile food, unclean food, all of which was considered unclean and unlawful by the Jews. I want to share a quote with you from the Book of Jubilees, which I think is quite evident. Now, the Book of Jubilees doesn't sound familiar because it's not a book of the Bible. Uh, it's not what Christians consider to be in the canon of Scripture. However, Jubilees is a critically important book for the study of the New Testament. It's a, a summary and an expansion of the law. And Jubilees provides a deep insight into the way that the Jews in the last two centuries before Christ thought about the importance of the law. I've mentioned before, like the book of Enoch, even Jesus Christ quotes the book of Enoch, but we don't have that in scripture. And so these other writings that influence, they may not be scripture, they're not divinely inspired, but they influence the way that people think. And the book is often called the Little Genesis, when you see it in Latin or Syriac translations, because of what's in it. The book was written in the second century BC, so a couple hundred years uh, before Christ. And it's written in Hebrew, and it's a summary, and it's an expansion of what you see in Genesis and Exodus. So creation story, but especially the law is in there as well. And because the book has appears to have been written in Hebrew by a member of a priestly family, uh, Jubilees gives that unique insight into the heart of an observant Jew in the period just prior to the events of the New Testament. Jubilees 22.16. It says, And do thou, my son, Yaakov, which is Jacob, remember my words, and observe the commandments of Abraham, thy father. Separate thyself from the nations, and eat not with them. And do not according to their works, and become not their associate, for their works are unclean, and all their ways are a pollution, and an abomination, and uncleanness. Jubilees informed the way the people thought. It informed Peter's mind, it informed the Pharisees' mind, uh, it informed a lot of movements at the time. And here it's saying things like, be separate from the nations, don't eat with them, don't associate with them. Whatever works they might be doing, whatever projects they might have, have nothing to do with them. Be totally isolated because everything they do is a pollution. And if you meet with them, if you gather with them, it makes you unclean. And this becomes, in their tradition, law. To be with a Gentile is to break the law of God. The Jews of the first century believed that having fellowship with Gentiles, especially eating with them, was equal to breaking God's law. And so Peter says that. Verse 28 there, he says, You have heard, or you yourselves know, how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me. 
that I should not call any person common or unclean. The vision of the sheep was not just about food. It was about people, too. Some have claimed that Peter's vision dealt more with the food laws than with interactions with Gentiles. But this overlooks the clear fact that those two are inextricably related. They're inseparable, this idea of Gentiles and food laws. And we'll see that more in the book of Acts. Leviticus 22, it says in there, I am the Lord your God who has separated you from the peoples. You shall therefore separate the clean beast from the unclean and the unclean bird from the clean. You shall not make yourselves detestable by beast or by bird or by anything with which the ground crawls, which I have set apart for you to a hold unclean. You shall be holy to me. That is, you should be separate to me, separate from the other nations. For I, the Lord, am holy. I am separate. I am distinct and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. Here we see he's saying keep these food laws in order to be separate from them. Not in the way that Jubilee says, because they're unclean and they're gross. God calls Israel to be a light to these people. But what God is saying there is when you keep this law, when you refuse to eat pork, when you refuse that cheeseburger, when you refuse to eat these things, you're showing that the world that you are different, that there's something unique about you. We use this kind of language all the time as Christians that we should act in a way that the world thinks there's something different about us, that makes them curious about why we act the way we do and behave the way we do. That's the kind of thing that's happening here. When the Father declares all food clean to Peter, just as Jesus did during his ministry, he's taking down this biggest hurdle that stopped the Jews from evangelizing the Gentiles and reaching those people, as Israel was always meant to do. Just as Jesus told Peter to feed his sheep, feed Israel three times, now the Father tells Peter in the vision to feast with Gentiles three times in order to feed them the gospel. The Jewish Christian can have fellowship and eat with Gentiles without becoming unclean. And now the Gentile, upon salvation, doesn't have to become like the Jews, they don't have to be a proselyte. They don't even have to be a god fear. They don't have to obey all those food laws. They don't have to worry about how they trim their beard or what kind of materials their clothes are made of. All those things that separate Israel, the Gentiles don't have to worry about that anymore. And declaring all men clean, that's not to be confused with calling all people righteous, because that's not what it means. And calling all people clean, God displays for Peter and the world that he does not show partiality. And this is the last point I want to make. Verses 34 and 35. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Romans 2 verse 11 very simple verse. It says, For God shows no partiality. Romans 10, 12. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. This does not just apply to Jew and Gentile relationships, this idea of God showing favoritism, or that God doesn't show favoritism. It applies to things like wealth. Galatians 2, 6 says, But from those who were of high reputation... What they were makes no difference for me. God shows no partiality. Well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. Paul's saying their reputation, their social status doesn't mean anything. God is impartial. James chapter 2 says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in. And if you pay attention to the one who wears fine clothing and say, you sit in a good place. While you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. You have not then made distinctions among yourselves or have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts. So James applies it to that. God doesn't have partiality for the rich or the poor. Paul says God doesn't have partial favor or favorite. He doesn't favorite uh, the rich, or I mean the reputable, the socially 
influential over the non. He doesn't do that. And just as God chose no partiality, so too must Peter, in this relationship with Cornelius, show no partiality. And so too must we not show any favoritism or partiality. And I wonder, and I don't know, I can't really figure this sort of thing out, but I wonder, how are some of the ways that you show partiality or favoritism to those around you? How do I do it? Especially in terms of how you care for them, or love them, or seek out fellowship with them. The Jews had the Gentiles. That's a pretty large group to discriminate against. It's pretty much everybody in the world. But who do you have? Maybe it's what James mentions. Maybe you're partial to those with money and fail to love and have fellowship with the poor in your life. Maybe our preferences are generational. Maybe you have disdain for younger generations or older generations. For most of us, I think the people that we spend the most time with happen to have the same skin color as us. This is probably a result of the fact that all of us, except for uh, some of my family, unless I'm mistaken here, are white. And white people happen to be the majority in America. And so statistically speaking, you're more likely to spend time with other white people. And that's fine. But perhaps for some of us, that's a matter of prejudice. Favoritism. That stops us from loving our neighbors who happen to have different skin colors than us. Here's where I struggle. Maybe you're partial to those that have the same political persuasion as you. Maybe you find it difficult to have fellowship with those who, in their beliefs, may infuriate you or disagree with you politically. Maybe it's hard for you to see them as God's clean and beautiful and precious image bearers. Maybe you, like God, truly do not treat people with favoritism. I hope that's the case. But I would encourage all of us to think about these things, to pray about these things, to look at the people groups that we are involved in and a part of, and to look at those that we're not a part of, to look at those people groups, those kinds of people that we treat like dirty, unclean, Gentile dogs. And I would encourage all of us to pray through those issues so that we as individuals, so that we as a church might love our neighbors as ourselves. Because I promise you that if God can bring together, and I don't know how he did it, but he did it, if God can bring together Jewish and Roman believers to worship and to share meals and to live the Christian life and fellowship in a way more real way than we do it today, then certainly any of those things I just mentioned can be things we learn to ignore or learn to appreciate about another person. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the example of Peter, who only by your power and your grace is able to set an example of here, of not showing partiality. Father, we can see that Peter, even in his actions, doesn't seem too excited about what's happening, but he's obedient, and he follows, and he listens, and he questions, and he, and he prays, and he works through these things. And Father, I just pray that you would work through us as we reflect on this, as we look to hunt any of those prejudices we have, any of those things that we use to show favoritism to one group or another, or one person over another, and we would eliminate that. That we wouldn't worry about our reputation, we wouldn't worry about our appearance, we wouldn't worry about any of these fickle, surface things that hold us back from loving our neighbors, that you would make us passionate people for the gospel and for others, that we would see this world that we're about to leave into and enter into as a, as a broken and dying world in need of reconciliation. Father, I pray that you would empower us to not hold anything back, to not be afraid, not be tied up by those things that distract us from doing your will in our lives. And Father, we ask these things, we beg these things in the name of Christ. Amen.